seminar on harnessing the revolution for water innovation. Uh, the chairs for the seminar are myself, Matthew Verbila, and my colleague, Gang Liu. So uh, just wanted, before we get started, I wanted to mention that this seminar is one part of a three-part series that's being co-convened by Dr. Joan Rose from Michigan State, along with the World Bank, GSMA, the Chinese Academy of Sciences, San Diego State University, and Venthic Technologies. Um, so we, we would love to see uh, all of you join for the second and third sessions. The second one will be hybrid. The third one will be in person. And uh, more information about that will be provided at the end of this seminar. Special thanks to Ala as well, who played a huge role to help coordinate all three seminars. All right, so I'll turn it over to my colleague, Gang to describe our aim for this session. Uh, thanks, uh, Mashu. So our aim is to uh, provide a comprehensive overview of the digital transformation in the water sector uh, worldwide. I still uh, remember our very first meeting for preparing the sessions. So the um, digital uh, uh, digitalization of, of water sector is uh, rapidly uh, happening all over the world. I think this is a very good uh, platform and moment for uh, sharing the progress and ideas. And our goal is to uh, emphasize that the uh, digital uh, revolution is uh, multidimensional. So you can see that uh, we have uh, our uh, participants from different backgrounds, and we also cover a very uh, good uh, uh, representatives uh, from the uh, worldwide uh, uh, areas and, and regions. So I hope we can uh, deliver uh, by this uh, session uh, what is the up-to-date uh, progress and what is uh, for the future to come uh, regarding the uh, digitalization uh, in water sector. Uh, Matthew, uh, you can go ahead. Sounds great. So let's play a quick game before we get started called Ask Chat GB GPT. So just for fun, I typed in this question. Uh, before the session, how will artificial intelligence and digital innovations revolutionize the water sector to support sustainable development? And this is uh, not the entire answer that was provided, but I took a couple snippets that I thought were interesting to start off the session today um, and take it for what it is. But that, you know, some of these things might actually come up in the conversation today, right? Predictive anal analytics for water management, detection of leaks and in infrastructure deterioration. Um, using these tools for water quality analysis or treatment, um, irrigation for food production, consumer engagement education, to name a few. Um, so our agenda for today, we've got two keynote speakers, 10 minutes each. That's including Q&A. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Mr. Saroj Kumar Jha from the World Bank. The second speaker, Mina Sankaran from Kitos. Then we have two abstract presentations, followed by a panel discussion and some closing remarks. So without further ado, I will introduce our first speaker, um, Mr. Saroj Kumar Jha is the Global Director for the World Bank Group's Water Global Practice. In his current assignment, he is a core member of the senior management team, which drives the policy direction of the practice. He oversees a portfolio of $24 billion in water-related investments, analytical work, multi-donor, trust funds, and global partnerships. Mr. Jha supports an integrated approach to water security and inclusive service delivery, accelerated climate action and food security through the bank's global water strategy and providing policy advice and operational support in response to, to specific country needs. Um, an Indian national, Mr. Jha joined the World Bank in 2005 after working for more than a decade with the government of India and also with the United Nations agencies. So without further ado, Saroj, you can take it over. Yeah. Are you to see? Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. It's very clearly, very clear. Uh, first of all, apologies for being late. Uh, we were in a bilateral meeting with uh, His Excellency, the Minister for Water Supply, 
uh, water resources and uh, uh, from Egypt. Um, first of all, I really want to thank the organizers for inviting me to be part of this event. And uh, this is happening at a time when uh, the World Bank is uh, prioritizing water as a very important global challenge. And uh, we are going to be uh, stepping up our work in the water sector, uh, both in terms of our engagement in the countries, but also financing. And, and we expect our financing for water sector to increase three to four times uh, in the coming years uh, with a view to create a bigger impact and on scale across the world, benefiting many more millions of people who need access to clean drinking water and sanitation, which of course will be provided by water utilities, more institutions working in the water sector. I think, so that's the context. Uh, within that, uh, uh, we want to make sure that water sector broadly uh, benefits from the uh, from the evolution that is happening in the space of technology and innovation. And that would essentially mean how do we really digitalize the entire water cycle so that we can make the system more efficient, we can cut down the costs and, uh, and help this water systems deliver better services uh, across the entire water supply chain. So with that in mind, then how do we bring uh, technology into the water space. Uh, we set up recently a digital water team uh, that really is engaging with uh, many of you on the call. And we are very happy with the partnership we have set up with many of you to take this work forward. But this does essentially mean understanding how do water institutions uh, embrace technology and, and use it essentially for better functioning, better delivery of services. As part of this, uh, I understand in many countries, we've done the uh, digital maturity survey to really understand what is coming in the way of uh, water operators uh, adopting technology uh, as part of their entire uh, service delivery uh, and, and what are the obstacles they're facing and it is no brainer that what we found in the survey that uh, lack of, first of all, lack of leadership on this agenda, but also lack of uh, capacity, lack of necessary skills and the budget to be really able to take this work forward, which is emerging as a, as a set of uh, challenges they are facing based on the survey. Our team is advancing this work with specific uh, water institutions in many countries to really understand what does the uh, digital journey look like for those water institutions? And, and they have been looking at many countries which provide us a lot of uh, a very concrete set of ideas as to how we can help those countries to move forward uh, in, in building that uh, digital capabilities across the organization. And this work is something that we will uh, scale up so that more countries can benefit from not only the survey, but the digital assessment of the institutions and how they can really create the, uh, in the ecosystem in the water institutions that can help accelerate digitalization of uh, the functioning and the operations and the service delivery by the water operators. And we are also, uh, we have a new president who is a, uh, a former CEO of MasterCard, who strongly believes in technology as the game changer in provision of services. So clearly that is also going to help this agenda moving forward. The last thing I wanted to mention is that uh, um, from my side, I see uh, water sector uh, really uh, providing uh, space for uh, innovation and uh, and where technology can essentially help us to close the gap in terms of access to clean drinking water, better sanitation, better irrigation, uh, and helping deal with the uh, issues of floods and drought 
which are becoming more frequent, more intense due to climate change. So embracing a digital agenda across the entire life cycle uh, in many countries where we work in various uh, support to the governments, I think is going to become extremely important. <laughs> And uh, the community of practice on digital water that we have within the World Bank is going to work with our country teams, work with various uh, partners to move this agenda forward. They will have my strong support to go to take this agenda to the next level. As we increase investment in the water sector, I think uh, there I expect more demand for for water institutions to become more efficient so that they can make use of more public and increasingly private capital coming into the water sector. And a more digitally capable water operator is likely to attract more private capital uh, in, in various investments. So I think it is very much um, uh, as part of building the, the foundational work that the utilities will be doing to, to be able to attract private capital. So very happy to be part of it. Uh, I'm very happy that you're organizing this uh, session. Uh, my role is to support my team, uh, Jean Martin, Jihoon, and many others are working. Again, my apologies for joining late, uh, but we are around like uh, many people here. We are just running from one meeting to another, but it's, so it's just so important to meet so many people and talk to all of you about it. Uh, but I will stay connected for some more time before I move to my next meeting, but very happy that you're doing it. You have my strong support and uh, very happy to see my own team, Jean Martin, taking this work forward with in more partnership with so many of you on the call. Let me stop here. Excellent. So um, we've got a couple minutes right now for a couple questions. And with, there's also a link in the chat to a poll where you can uh, type your question if you wish. You're also welcome to unmute and ask a question. Um, I have one to get things started. Uh, so my question is, I'm wondering you talked about a lot of the benefits of digitalization of the water sector. Um, but what do you think about people who might point out challenges in locations where there's um, lack of access to connectivity? And how, how might that those two sectors work in parallel, you know, connecting uh, remote areas with uh, internet and data so that these tools can be more accessible? Well, I think, you know, for, for me, it's very hard to think there are areas uh, in the world which are not, uh, and there are people with, there are more number of people with mobile phones than toilets. So everybody has a smartphone. So I think as long as we are able to put the whole water cycle, you know, from precipitation to water, uh, what we call generation, creation, distribution, into the user's access and the feedback from the users, I think you are really able to create a much more efficient system that people trust uh, and people can feedback. And, uh, you know, I was a director in the Middle East recently. I just came into this job, but before I was in the Middle East, I mean, Iraq, even after the massive devastation caused by the Islamic State, uh, you still had the mobile phones functioning and people were able to communicate. And I saw this firsthand when we were trying to help rebuild the water supply, electricity infrastructure, roads, bridges, you know, and we did massive, uh, and it is still continuing, but we were able to rely on that uh, feedback from young people, from women's group on how water supply was being delivered to young people, uh, to people in the areas uh, devastated by the Islamic State occupation and young people were able to give feedback. I think where we do have a challenge is, is in terms of how do the water operators, the utilities uh, and utilities sitting within municipalities, how do we give them the tools they need to be able to benefit from technology? And, and this is where I think we got to invest. We got to make it a priority. 
we got to increase the level of attention to this agenda. We can't just leave it to one IT guy in a water utility trying to do the stuff. This is not an IT stuff. We're talking about a new ecosystem. We're talking about a new approach to uh, planning, implementing, delivering services where digital plays an extremely important role along the entire value chain. So yeah, connectivity is a constraint, but I don't think really this is a constraint. I think we have a, con we have a mindset we have a problem of leadership in trying to put uh, digital water as a priority. Thank and you. And I think yours should help actually and encourage more leaders. I was just with the Egyptian minister and we were talking about how technology is helping him to manage irrigation better, irrigation services in Egypt. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a great tra tra segue transition over to our, our next talk and we appreciate your, your time, Mr. Ja. Um, so I'll turn it over to Gang to introduce our second keynote speaker. Thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Matthew. Uh, our second speaker is Mina uh, Sakenra. Uh, Mina Sakenra is the founder and CEO of uh, Ketos. Uh, a vertical integrated robotics, uh, AI, and IoT solution to deliver water intelligence to industry. She is an uh, engine printer, uh, change maker, and a technologist uh, uh, excelling across uh, 14 hundred companies of startups over the last 23 years of her career. She has been recognized by her uh, by Forbes, uh, Goldman uh, Sachs, Nasdaq. Uh, E&Y, uh, Passenger, and most recently, recently by uh, UBS uh, as a global visionary for her work with Kidos over the last eight years. Uh, she has made significant uh, contributions through her nonprofits and several cultural participations while mentoring girls to solve the leading challenges of our future generations. As an engineer and a creative artist, her love for problem solving, building teams, and innovative solutions that transform the world is of utmost importance. Uh, Mina has a bachelor de bachelor's degree in electronics engineering from uh, India and a master's in electronic engineering from the University of Texas at uh, Arlington. She has also completed uh, foreign policy studies uh, through uh, continuing education at Stanford University. So now uh, let's uh, welcome uh, Mina to give her keynote uh, speech. Well, first of all, thank you for all the kind words, uh, Dr. Yang. And uh, it's an honor to be here. And I'm very grateful for Matthew and Ella to think of me and uh, have this opportunity. and. Uh, I think following uh, in the footsteps of uh, Mr. Ja, uh, he, he certainly set the stage for the financing support. And I think uh, a lot of what I might say about water, I, I come from a place of passion and technology, very closely aligned for water. Um, and I think you'll hear probably most of the things, some of these might really resonate for you saying, hey, I've heard this a hundred times, but what I really wanna do is highlight a bit of the sense of urgency that I have seen lacking in the sector. Uh, you know, Mr. John mentioned leadership and the mindset, but it's also the inertia of the adoption. And so let's let's dive in. We have a very uh, limited time. We all know that there is a massive amount of population that doesn't have access to safe, clean drinking water. Uh, we're all aware still with the amount of technology impact that exists in the world that there's still human beings that are and children that are impacted. Uh, and personally, just to let you, you know, this might be an interesting can I, uh, a fact, but I personally went through about 14 water bowl illnesses before I was even 15 based on the area and where I lived. Um, but what what is what is kind of concerning is I was blessed, but not everybody, you know, gets that second shot. Now, what is also tricky is when you think about drinking water and then you think about all the other aspects of water, industrial water, agriculture, um, that's a majority of the water that people don't actively think about because when they think about water, they just think drinking water. But a massive amount of water is discharged and part of that water, how much of that water is really getting treated and recycled and reused to the extent that's uh, important for us to be thinking about. Now, 
all of this being known, our habits haven't changed. If you look at status quo for the last couple of decades, we are still using extensive amounts of very manual, archaic, static processes. What I mean by that is, let's say you're using some online analyzer that's come out in the last 10 years. You're still very physically stuck to one system doing one thing. So let's say, you know, I'm just going to pick a few people here. Let's say Mr. Richard has one uh, concern around chlorine. He goes and acquires a chlorine analyzer. Two months later, Mr. Richard realizes that, you know, I have a nitrates issue. Guess what he has to do? Now he has to go and acquire another net new nitrate analyzer. The reason why I point that out is we're not, yes, there's massive amounts of technology, but we're not making it easier either for the entire masses to adopt digitalization at the pace at which we need to see the change. So a lot of things have to kind of fall in place for that adoption curve to really be as smooth as we want it to be and the uptick. One of the first things is not just a technological solution, but really thinking about how does a technology solution affect the workforce and the business model of the current work water sector and how do all those three aspects work together? Because if policy workforce and business model, all three don't align with the innovation we're bringing in technology, then only disruption in technology alone is not gonna get us to the finish line. This is extremely critical to, to be fully realized. And we're still doing a lot of things manually. People are running around still driving around, grab, picking grab samples. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more in the end, maybe a couple of minutes of what we do. Um, but one thing to, to just think of is in just a few years of deployment of what we have been implementing, we've been able to reduce 2000 metric tons of carbon. That's a blip, but if that's possible, anything is possible, especially for the large state of the art water companies. So what do we sort of think about when you look at overall water solutions? The word I want you to leave with is accountability. Um, and another way I, I thought to simplify it, I kind of came up with like, okay, think of four A's. We need solutions that are autonomous. And let's take one step further. If we start thinking about solutions that are distributed as well as centralized, how do you get that? It doesn't have to be one or another. It's a combination of both. If we can get our sensing to become very distributed, so they become our eyes on the field, but the intelligence to be very centralized, then you have the best of both. And yet you're able to have a very cohesive design in terms of how you integrate information. So you want autonomous. You don't want too much manual intervention that allows for lack of resource efficiency, operational efficiency, and a wide variety of things that we can dive into. You want data to be actionable. Um, when you think of AI, when you think of lots of platform companies coming up, your output is as good as the data you put in. So if you don't have high caliber data sets, you're not going to get actionable intelligence. And so it's really important that your data is actionable because nowadays the, the utilities that are adopting solutions, they're flooded with data. And then what do you do with it? Now you have to go and hire a whole bunch of data analysts. The utilities don't have that luxury to just be able to hire a lot of different types of resources the way the technology service providers do. So it's extremely important to realize that accountability means moving forward, you're devising a solution that's interdisciplinary, that's cross-functional, that allows mutual acknowledgement, but mutual responsibility between the service provider and the utility as a whole. It's no longer a transaction-based solution. Hey, you want a water uh, probe? Here's your water probe, off I go, here's your service contract, I'll see you in five years when I have to collect my renewal. That's no longer going to suffice. And I hope that the water utilities are going to challenge the service providers in not just accepting the status quo and demanding more for what they are liable for, for their own communities. Um, the other part is being affordable. This cannot be a very cost prohibitive solution. Technology has to become affordable and it's absolutely possible. You do not have to have a very large CapEx involved model. There are alternative type of business models which are still focused on value creation and focused on how are you generating that importance for that customer. And at the end of the day, if all of this is not accurate, then it's a moot point. So you want to build 
innovation in a way that's comparable to the labs because that's where the traditional credibility has been built for the user and it's extremely personal for them. Um, and this is an example of the types of business models that are out there that are being successful, where you're no longer stuck with physical hardware sale, physical maintenance, manual intervention for repair and warranty. You really are transitioning into the way we're doing Zoom here, the way we're doing software. And utilities are comfortable with SaaS models because if you look at, they, they are uh, acquiring a lot of other types of software. It's really about working with procurement to figure out what is the best model and how can we structure that with them? So keeping procurement involved, keeping the policymaker involved, keeping the operators involved, it has to be a very interoperable solution. The other thing I would take away is if you're building a tech solution saying, I am all it, that's also not going to fly. That was the old way of doing business. You have to think about the tough questions and the best of breed way of doing things. What is my interoperable way? How do I bring in other data from my different aspects of the plant in a way that I can have a single pane of glass, but I'm allowing a lot of feed so that it's um, intelligence that's not one point in time, but it's actually much more comprehensive. Um, another point that I wanna make is you can't act on what you don't measure. So looking at your entire blueprint of what you have, whether it's groundwater, whether it's surface water, whether it's produced water, whether it's wastewater, Process automation is, is key, but looking at the entire life cycle and looking at that blueprint is important rather than doing band-aid fixes that become very difficult um, to resolve for in, in the future. And um, by the way, uh, Mr. Yang, you better keep me on a time check because I can go on. So tell me if I have like a, a minute or two so I can kind of get a couple of my thoughts up. Yes, you have one minute. Oh, have one minute. Okay, thank you. So um, with that, maybe let me just uh, dive in and just kind of give you a, a quick sense of, you know, what we've done just to give you something, uh, get you plant some seeds in your mind. So here's a robotic solution that basically uh, right now we're monitoring about 29 billion gallons of water globally. And we've generated north of about 262 million data insights. The customers never have to open the box, repair the box. And here's the key the workforce that is existing workforce do not have to become technologists overnight. You cannot expect them to suddenly have all this massive technology ramp up. The technology service provider is the technologist providing that support while the utility folks let them be the best of what they do as water experts. That partnership is extremely important to have the symbiotic relationship be successful. And we work with the agriculture, industrial and municipalities um, one of the key aspects also, I would say, is looking at holistically all aspects of water, water efficiency, water quality. It's like the yin and yang. If you're not able to integrate the water quality and efficiency in a way that you're providing insight, then customers are left, again, wanting a piece of the puzzle. So I'll leave you with this. We still have a massive issue in terms of water demand in the future. We all believe we can reduce a certain impact in terms of safe water. We all are absolutely capable of bringing smart, safer, sustainable water for agriculture industries and cities because they're all very interconnected, whether it's food safety or it's water safety. We have different types of digital technologies. I urge each one of you to be an ambassador during this entire World Water Week and think about what does accountability mean to you? How do you contribute towards this notion of bringing together this interoperable, interchangeable, and cross-functional ecosystem. And ultimately, yes, financing is very, very key. But remember that when you think about United States and 55,000 utilities, there's a very small percentage that are the elite digital operators. The rest of the utilities need the kind of support that a very strong ecosystem allows for. So um, I hope all of you can join me in this journey of really revolutionizing the way people think about water, uh, which is what I really hope to achieve in this vision. So thank you for that and uh, excited for whatever questions I can help answer. Thank you, Mina, appreciate it. Um, so we do have some some nice questions in the chat and in the poll. And in, it, because of time, we're gonna move on to the next speaker, but I'll encourage you to interact with um, our participants in the chat and we'll have some opportunity during the panel discussion as well, which you'll be moderating. So without further ado, I will 
introduce our first abstract presenter. Uh, Mr. Bertrand Richard is a project manager and water resources expert at the Danish Hydraulic Institute. He will present his group's work on global hydrological data for better water management worldwide. Yes, thank you. Uh, let me share my screen. Yes, I heard it's, uh, it's there now. So hello everyone. So my name is uh, Baton Risho and I'm uh, working for DHI and I'm uh, presenting today an abstract which was submitted by my uh, colleagues, uh, Alexander Murray and Nicola Barbarini um, about uh, global hydrological data for better water management worldwide. So we've been talking about innovation, about how we can uh, tackle the challenges and one, uh, DHI is known for the work on, on modeling, um, hydraulic and hydrological modeling. And today I will present you some of the latest uh, research and innovation work we've done related to um, hydrological modeling uh, to basically enable uh, to make use of the large amount of global data sets that is available worldwide uh, in a meaningful way through uh, a model. Um, So the model I'm presenting today is called the DHI Global Hydrological Model. And you have here uh, the framework of, of this model, which is uh, basically the framework of an operation model, which um, is fed by global data sets, uh, which I will detail a bit later. Uh, and the model uh, has two components. Uh, one is a distributed uh, NAM or rainfall runoff model, which then feed into uh, um, a fast river router, so basically to route the the, the runoff through uh, the river network, and that allows this model to basically provide a large number of of outputs uh, related to to um, the hydrological model. So it could be runoff, overland flow, base flow, uh, soil moisture content. This uh, um, framework uh, has been built in a way that is very fast to run. Um, it takes less than an hour to run the full model on the global scale, uh, which allows uh, basically um, the system to be run every time there is a new uh, forecast, uh, for example, weather or meteorological forecast available uh, worldwide. Um, the the model was uh, built based on a uh, different type of, of data sets, uh, global data sets for the calibration. So you have here some example of data set that have been used, uh, land use, topography, uh, drainage des density, uh, also soil type and so on. Uh, so the way this model was built is that it was calibrated uh, in areas uh, where uh, we have access to flow measurements for calibration and then uh, using a region regionalization approach, uh, the model was then uh, applied in areas with no data. So basically it can be used uh, worldwide uh, through this uh, regionalization approach. Um, so to give you an, an idea of how this model uh, can be represented specially, uh, you have here uh, the whole globe and, and the model covers an area of uh, from minus 60 uh, degree to plus 80 degrees in latitude. Um, and uh, there are about uh, 1 million grids uh, on, the, on the model because each grid is about uh, 11 by 11 kilometer. So for each grid, uh, we have we resample all the input data sets. So it's a gridded rainfall uh, runoff model, which then feed into a river network uh, for basically routing the runoff to the uh, catchment, hydrological catchment. There are more than one million catchments in this uh, in this model. So it's a really large uh, scale model, but at the same time uh, built in a very operational way that can be run in a very efficient way to to provide a result. Uh, almost anywhere on the globe, uh, yeah. And now I will actually give you some example of application for the, uh, such uh, such model, such uh, innovation that we, we have now uh, in place. So this model 
is being uh, developed uh, 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 more and more, but we already have some good example of, of uh, application that we've done. The first example I want to, to talk about is uh, one example in Kenya, where we have used this model uh, for testing climate change scenarios. So we had to, uh, to look at a large, a very large area, um, many counties in Kenya, and uh, we had a very uh, short time to actually run an assessment, a water resources as as assessment, and including the impact of climate change. Using this model, we could run a number of scenarios uh, very uh, efficiently and give some, some um, relatively uh, almost immediate results to inform decision makers. Uh, so this is one of the first and maybe uh, logical application. We have recently done a very similar one on the in the Senegal uh, River Basin. So again, a very large area uh, um, over four different countries where we had to, to do an hydrological assessment of the whole uh, Senegal River Basin in West Africa. So starting from this uh, global hydrological model, we could actually have um, a first assessment of the uh, water resources available and, and also uh, basically inform uh, the decision maker, in this case, countries, uh, member states, and the river basin organization, where investment should be directed uh, to make sure they are make, making use, uh, best use of the water available in the basin. One last application I would like to mention, it's, it's slightly uh, maybe a bit outside uh, what you could think of, uh, it's related to plastic, to macroplastic and litter uh, transport. So we are involved in a large project with, uh, with UNEP and a number of partners mentioned below um, uh, related to, to um, plastic pollution. And this uh, hydrological model can basically be uh, applied also uh, for um, tracking microplastic in rivers and therefore in ocean. As you know, uh, plastic, I think there is more than 80% of plastic that is actually uh, going uh, to, to the ocean uh, that is actually coming from the from land through uh, different ri from, through rivers. So we could use this model to detect hotspots, both on the historical, but also uh, you can think of using this model for early warning because we can then use it with uh, forecast information to detect uh, where uh, there will be hotspot of uh, large plastic pollutions. That was um, that was it uh, for my presentation, and I look forward to to discussion and, and question on that. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so for the abstract presentations, we'll also be taking questions in the poll or in the chat, and we encourage you to in interact with the speakers through the chat feature. Gang will introduce the next abstract presenter. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Matthew. Uh, our next presenter is Anton Erfels. Um, is a senior water scientist uh, working on water systems and climate uh, adaptation for International Rice Research Institute in Nepal. Uh, let's welcome. Okay, thank you, Matthew and Gang for inviting me for this session. Um, it's a pleasure to speak here and I think it, my talk really will fit in very nicely with the, the previous speakers. And so I'm excited to share just in the few minutes I have some what I think is very exciting applications of big data and um, AI models um, in the space of irrigation and water management, mostly in Asia. And also here I want to thank the yeah, USAID and Gates Foundation for, for the funding, because most of this uh, work has been done under the Serial Systems Initiative for South Asia Cross CGIR project. So as was mentioned, is this not moving? As was mentioned earlier, um, we really have this big challenge of solving the water crisis and agriculture is a key part of that challenge. But especially in low income countries, getting the hydrological cycle, as um, Saroj was saying, into digital format, it's, it's really quite a difficult task. So what I'm will be sharing is an approach that we are taking um, to take landscape level agronomic data and see how that can inform decision makers um, and policies. Um, at the landscape level, really. And for that, most of the data comes from this LCAS, Landscape Crop Assistance Assessment Survey, um, that we use to run our models. Um, it has been developed in uh, cooperation with ICAR, uh, the Indian 
Institute for Agricultural Research in Cornell University in South Asia since 2016. So really for quite a few years, we've been fine tuning the surveys and several data sets. By now we have collected more than 50,000 um, household surveys that are collected under a time of less than 45 minutes per household. So it really allows one to take a modular setup collect key information of agricultural management, including water management, um, and then um, map that at a large scale and see how the different important components of the agricultural systems interact and how they also limit decisions in water management. So we have several publications um, based on this data, and I will show uh, about like two small cases of how these models can be used to make better decisions and how we can see these improve the decisions that um, policymakers make. So basically what we do is we take this data sets. And so this area you can see in the map here, it's uh, the state of Bihar, some of um, Southern Nepal. So it's an area of more than hundred million people living there, largely agricultural. And we, all the dots you see are data points from our surveys. And so what we do is we train an, an AI model. And the great thing about these models nowadays is you cannot only ask for predictions, like what happens if, which is really important, but you can also ask what's called interpretations and diagnostics. So why does a certain configuration lead to a certain outcome? So we can better understand where to intervene and when to intervene. And I think that also is really important for the points of making um, the investments that we're looking to do in agriculture with water management much, much more effective and efficient. So on the left side, you can, for example, see a decision tree that can tell us in which circumstances of agricultural management, for example, um, if your wheat sowing is later than a certain date, how much the impact of having less than two irrigations or more than two irrigations will have on your yield. Um, at the same time, here you can see on the right side, it's a bit more of a complicated situation, but still the main difference in the yield results here um, comes from the irrigation component. So what this allows us to do is to see, okay, where, can we really invest in irrigation? Where is it gonna have a big impact and how much impact can we expect? And where do we um, rather invest in other economic issues um, to improve water productivity given the same levels of water use? Okay, so the second example on the right side, it's where we ask what if all farmers, everything else considered equal, so including nitrogen management, which is very important for GHG emissions um, and um, sowing dates and other, other key practices. Um, given all of these equal, um, where would we see the largest increase in yields if we increase the amount of irrigation a farmer applies? And then we cluster all these results and see, in, for example, the red dots, where it's going to, where's kind of the areas where the landscapes will have the, and the farms and the landscapes will have the largest response to these improved irrigation. So um, that really helps to then focus there because in other places, most likely water productivity will not be increased by improving water management, but in the blue areas, it's largely other economic issues where um, water productivity and yield outcomes can be increased. So um, you might ask, okay, investing in irrigation, that's, that's good, but what about the sustainability? And that's the part we're also working on right now. So together with these results I've just shown, we are looking to coupling these with scenarios and different estimates of recharge so that we can see what if, for example, we increase the numbers of irrigation, what would then be the impact on the dry season irrigation, what would be the impact on, uh, sorry, the dry season groundwater levels, what would be the impact on monsoon season groundwater levels, as these can be quite different in monsoon dominated regions. And also we want to couple it more with um, different hydrological products for remote sensing, such as uh, drainage classes. And yeah, I hope that in the um, yeah, fourth quarter of 2023, we'll share uh, the website where we can provide an overview of more information of these in consolidated formats. So stay tuned for that. With that, I want to thank and in the interest of time, give over and back for questions. And I really hope um, that we can together as a community in the water sector, also use and collaborate with the agriculture sector more to really make better decisions in water management and help to use the digital and AI tools that we have to make better decisions. So thank you and back to the host. Excellent, thank you. Um, so I, I encourage you all to type your questions for the speakers into the chat and also use our poll everywhere feature. 
Um, and I will go over, since we, you did finish a couple minutes uh, before eight minutes, I'll go over some of the questions we have so far so that we can set ourselves up for the panel. So um, the top ranked question right now, according to the upvotes, is how will digitalization reach low-income countries? Followed by how do you think digital might speed things up, unlock new business models? Any examples? A question for Rashad. Does the GHM take abstractions into account? Let's um, let's start with that question for, maybe we could do a quick question for Rashad in, and then we'll move on to the panel. Yes, yes, sorry, I was trying to unmute. Um, yes, abstraction. Actually, this model is is uh, meant to, to simulate uh, what can be called a naturalized flow. So uh, it's uh, it's supposed basically to be to be simulating uh, without the abstraction. So then it can actually be uh, uh, it depends basically when you you, you calibrate the model. Um, take or not uh, abstraction into account. When it comes to, for example, the uh, the Senegal application I mentioned, uh, the River Basin organization was interested in finding out uh, where they will look, well, they would do investments in their um, uncontrolled uh, catchments. So in this case, um, we were basically taking into account abstraction in the model. Uh, what was important, it was to find out how much water was available when and uh, will they for example uh, be able to build a small dam in a, in a specific location or not based on the uh, water available and we had calibrated the model based on the last 20 years of observations uh, so it it will depend basically on the application and the use of of the model uh, there excellent thank you um so we're going to move on to the panel and I'll introduce the panelists really quick, and then I'll turn it over to Mina, who will be moderating the panel discussion. So we have Kiwan Wang, who's the Smart Water Solution Director at Baidu. This is one of the largest companies in the world that specializes in internet-related services, products, and artificial intelligence. She has a PhD from Peking University with Smart Water Area um, as a research area, and also 17 years of technical experience in the sectors of water and energy. Uh, we also have Rick Brady, who is the founder of Richard Brady and Associates, where he served as the CEO until his retirement this past June. He is a licensed professional engineer and board certified environmental engineer in water and wastewater design. He's also graduated from Harvard, Harvard Business School's leading professional service firms and owner president management programs. Uh, and then we have Sham Berea from Xylem, who is a machine learning and a AI leader with 15 years of experience in corporate startup government and academic environments across the oil and gas, petrochem, transportation, agriculture, energy, and utilities sectors. At Xylem, he's the vice Pre president of digital transformation, where he also works in the water sector. So without further ado. Excellent. Well, thank you, everyone. Really appreciate um, Ray Quinn and, and uh, Sean joining us today, this afternoon. Um, Couple quick questions. I, I see the uh, layers of questions coming in and we have about a 15 minute panel. So maybe I'll start with uh, this question first to, to Rick um, and hope you don't mind me calling Rick. I was addressing his uh, mistake. I, I go by Rick, so that's good. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so Rick, when you think about the impact of climate adaptation and, and risk mitigation, um, there, people still don't associate water as much as they talk about carbon with uh, with climate. And I usually say that carbon tends to have higher and better marketing than than sort of water. What are your thoughts about, you know, how how as a community we, we can actually be doing better to serve that? And what do you think digitization can help accelerate? Well, I can, I can speak just from a California uh, point of view. Um, I mean, Southern California is a desert. Uh, we actually, are in, we're in a drought all the time, and then we have periods of rain. Uh, the, the problem in Southern California, it's billions of gallons of water are used every day. Uh, five of the 10 largest water treatment plants in the world are in Southern California. Uh, uh, nobody really knows where the water comes from. 
Mm -hmm. uh, it's very inexpensive. You can get a thousand gallons of water for a couple of dollars at your house. Uh, it doesn't have the same uh, interest level, let's say, as more uh, uh, like oil and gas, things are more expensive. So, you know, I've been working on smart water, I call it, since 2010 with IBM. And you know, the leading, they're the first person to coin the phrase, there's golden data. They had developed software in their uh, technology center in Israel to look for leakage. It was fascinating. I thought this is going to be a great thing. I did a pilot for the city of San Diego. Results are fantastic. There was no interest, no interest in the data, the results. Um, here it is 13 years later. I've, it hasn't really gotten much better. Now, there's more technologies, there's more softwares and things, but the, the, the first speaker, the problem with we're having is, is there's no leadership here. You look in Southern California where there's all the money in the world. Uh, I, I thought the value proposition was pretty strong. You know, we can find leakage. Mm -hmm. the, the, city, the city says they, they lose 10% of their water through leakage. That's 20 million gallons a day. You think there'd be some concern about that? There isn't. Um, so once you show off the data, it makes everybody look bad. Uh, jobs are at stake because now you have smart meters and meter readers are going to lose their jobs. So it's it's complicated. It's very frustrating. I, I've been on this for 13 years now, and I've not seen any improvements. Uh, and I've been around the world trying to sell this as well. You know, Puerto Rico, all the pharmaceutical companies use a lot of water. Bacardi, they had no interest. So government has no, there's not a profit motive in government. You can't sell them on an idea you can save money. You can't. Even in, even in industry where they have an interest in saving money, there's still not a lot of interest. So I, I, it's been frustrating. Uh, IBM gave up on it. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they don't do this anymore. Uh, some other companies are still trying to do it. I've been trying to help some of them unsuccessfully. <laughs> and, and Rick, it's it's yeah. um, you know it, it's interesting you mentioned that because it's sort of like the the water is priced so incorrectly that um, which also influences my my tangential question next next to Sham because that's what lands up having investors not having the level of risk appetite they want to have when they're thinking about startups, even if there are lots of really attractive, strong technological solutions coming out there because people are afraid about the adoption and this is just gonna become a technology that falls into a black hole. So uh, Sham, Xylem is a huge industry strategic um, and with massive uh, sort of, you know, spread of, uh, you know, outreach, how, how do you think Xylem can really play a critical role and, and you with, sort of, you know, leading the charge from a standpoint of taking that data and holding it as a mirror to all the industries and the users to really create a sense of urgency in the action. What, how do you guys think that you could really influence uh, the state of play right now? Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. And, and I'll start out just saying, Rick, I think many of the comments you made, they, they ring true to us, right? We've seen, we've got leak detection technologies, we've got inspection technologies, um, and it's a tough sell, you know, for many of the reasons that, that you described. Um, I, I think I'd, I'd echo some of what you said, Nina, in, in your remarks. There's definitely an ecosystem here that needs to develop. Uh, there's no single technology provider or, or solution provider that can solve it all, right? So I think there is going to be an ecosystem aspect to it. Um, and those don't just form organically, right? I mean, I think there's there's leadership that's needed on the provider side as well, you know, in terms of developing standards and, and data, you know, formats and normalization and things like that so that interoperability is actually achievable, right? So if everyone uses proprietary standards and proprietary data models, then you don't actually get any kind of interoperability. And so I think there's leadership that's needed in, ter in terms of developing those ecosystems. Um, but I also, I really like the theme of this session because we're talking about how digital transformation is multidimensional. It's not just about the technology. Um, and, and we've seen that, right, in, in many ways, because we've got a lot of technologies within Xylem um, and they deliver value, but either because of business model challenges or, you know, 
the things are just not the right skill sets and the human element that's inside utilities, whether it's at the operator level or the leadership level, uh, present just tremendous barriers. And I think recognition of the multi-dimensional aspect is also key for the for the industry as a whole. Yeah, thank thank you for sharing your thoughts, Sham. Very insightful and. Um, Kuan, to, to move forward to you, uh, first off, I want to give you the opportunity. Any any additional thoughts you have on on Rick or Shyam's comments uh, on the questions that they both addressed? Um, I'll, I'll let you go first. No, he's exactly right. Um, the, there's the, the, To me, the value proposition is so strong. I still, I still can't believe the agencies don't want this technology. Um, I've, 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 I've attacked this at every level going to the mayor of San Diego, down to general managers. And then you get down into the staff level and it just, there's no, no, uh, they don't want this. They don't want to know the truth. That's the way I've kind of concluded. Because once I told them the truth, I was the villain. They did not like me. I was on the news giving, a, giving an interview about our smart water pilot program in San Diego. And, and after that thing aired on TV, I was uh, nobody, I was in trouble. <laughs> For telling the truth. Rick, we're, so. we're going to have to talk offline. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anytime. I can talk about this all day long, by the way. Me too. Thir so 13 we'll have, years some we'll have some stories to share where we're not getting recorded. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Kwirwan, uh, just, just thoughts on um, how, how do you see this as you're looking at data, as you look at research, and also influencing sort of this you know, force that we're supposed to be recruiting because when people think AI and everyone wants to join the next wave of implementing change with technology and AI, they're not thinking, how do I join the water sector? They're really looking at a vast variety of other sectors. And if we want to bring in the youth, if we want to really blend in a wide variety of energy and intelligence and not lose the knowledge and the expertise from the retiring workforce, what are your thoughts about bringing all of that knowledge together to really move us forward? Okay, thank you for your question. And I think that um, from my point of view, especially the smart water is really popular, especially in China. And um, as you may know that for the AI stack, there's the full stack, it is including the computing and also the uh, deep learning system. And also we will have the big model just like OpenAI or something in, uh, we call Wenxin model in China from Baidu. And also we have the application. And it is really a very uh, challenging question how to bring all the, uh, how to say, uh, water sectors and uh, technology, uh, technology companies bring together. Because in, um, I would like to say that because for the, uh, uh, for the technical, uh, technical company, we need to see the markets so that we need to use and, on, and do some investment for our AI talents. And from the uh, water sector, and they need to see the uh, value of application. So it's really a big challenge for us to, to make a good connections for the uh, water sectors and the, uh, and, and the technical company together. But I would say that for the digital water, we have a many kind of a, a technology stack and we can utilize our, how to say, for example, for the um, a big models to collect all the, uh, for example, operation data together, just to provide our water sectors and for them to, how to say, uh, easy to access to the um, operations uh, experience. And for some uh, waterworks or some WWTP, we can use the small model, for example, uh, uh, data algorithm uh, to do some um, uh, power saving or, uh, or, or smart chemical dosing so that we can see some values uh, to, to, how to say, to see some values during the operations. So I think that we have a long ways to do, to explore our smart waters, especially in China. And I think it's also the case is over the world. And I think that for the smart water, especially we can see much more opportunities to utilize the AI technologies. And, 
from from our point of view, and uh, maybe AI will seek some uh seek more potentials from the uh, how to say industry, water industry. Yeah. yeah. No, thank you for sharing your thoughts. Um, I know we're running out of time here, and I think we have maybe a minute uh, or two max. I think Matthews uh, also have to have some closing comments here. So maybe a very quick round, just a couple words or one sentence. What would you, and we can start with you, Kwan, and then go to Sham and Rick, have Rick close it up for us. What are your thoughts? What would you want, you know, one sentence to say for all the government public sector people that are attending from all around the world here this week to really, you know, your thoughts on how they can work with the private sector to they can really help us build a better future? Um, I would say that uh, just one sentence. And I think that AI provide much more possibilities, especially for our water industry. So we need to embrace the AI technology. Yeah. I would say um, think systems, right? So, you know, to solve these enormous challenges, climate change, uh, regulations, contaminants, we really have to solve the systemic problems, right? So it's not about the individual point solutions. And so technology can play a role, but there's a lot more to it. Yeah, and for me, this will only be successful if there's a champion for it everywhere in the world. There has to be somebody at the top of an organization that will say, we shall do this. Um, otherwise, you're going to get resistance up and down from top to bottom. You don't have budget for it. But the other thing I'd say, and keep things as simple as possible. Uh, water and simple kind of need to go together. Yeah. And my last sentence before I hand it over to you, Matthew, would be um, as each person needs to be their own, think of themselves as a leader. We don't have to wait for leadership to input. So be selfless in your decision making. Your career might be five years in the utility or seven years in the utility, but think of it as how it's going to impact your generations and your community. So selfless, foresighted decisions. Thank you. I appreciate it. So thanks everyone for sticking around. I know we're a minute or two past the hour. Um, so just a reminder to please um, join us for sessions two and three, if you're able to session, they have the same title as this seminar. Session two will be hybrid tomorrow. Uh, so you can also join online if you're not in Stockholm. Session three will be in person on Wednesday in room C4 from 11 to 1230. Uh, gang, do you have any last words you'd like to share? Uh, yes, Matthew. Um, uh, I was uh, prepared to 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 uh, try to summarize something from the uh, session today, but I found it uh, really difficult. We say that... Um, uh, digitalization of water sector is multi-dimensional, uh, but after uh, the one hour very fruitful, fruitful uh, communication and sharing, I found it's there's too many uh, dimensional. So, it's, uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, looking into the time we have, uh, and it's really uh, too short to share everything, but it's a very good uh, uh, brainstorming and to uh, put things together and we have a very uh, broad uh, topic to be covered so we have climate change water sanitation uh, contaminants and i think this session is super uh, inspiring and uh, this is a very good start and we will for sure continue the discussion and uh, to bring forward the dig digital revolution of water sector and uh, this is ex exceptionally a very important moment to collect all those information and meaningful thoughts. And here I'd like to uh, thank uh, John, Ella, Ma uh, Matthew, and everyone joining us today and uh, the coming two days and in the future. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Appreciate everyone's uh, attention and, and for staying a few minutes past the hour. Enjoy the rest of World Water Week.